Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a lesson on securing a wireless network. Now, in another lesson in this course, we learned the basics on how to set up a wireless network, whereas in this lesson, we're going to talk about how to secure that wireless network. So let's go ahead and get started. So when it comes to how to secure a wireless network, and I'm going to tell you just right out the gates that this really does nothing for securing your wireless network. I would really analogize this to, this is like locking your car doors. Okay, in other words, if someone wants to break into your car and they know anything at all about how to do so, they're going to do it. Okay, so if someone really wants to get in, they can get past this without much difficulty. But this helps keep the honest people honest. The, the first item I have here is disabling the SSID broadcast. Okay, you know, when you are looking for a wireless network, right, you're looking to connect to a wireless network, you open up your utility on your client and you see the list of wireless networks that are available. Well, the reason you can see that those wireless networks are available is because their SSIDs or the names of those networks are being broadcast. If you don't broadcast the SSID, meaning if they don't see the presence of the wireless access point or the wireless network, they may not know it's there to even attack. Now again, there are very, very easy ways that they can go out there and search using other more sophisticated utilities to learn about a wireless network that doesn't have its SSID broadcast, but again, it keeps the honest people honest. They don't know there's a network there, they can't attack it. Now the downside to using this method is that the users who are supposed to get on the network, well, they're not going to see it either. So they're going to have to be that much better about knowing what they're connecting to and knowing how to set that up. Another real simple form of protection is something called MAC filtering. And this is where you can specify what computers are allowed to connect. And you do it based upon the MAC address of their wireless network card. So you can create this actual whitelist of, you know, let's say there's 10 laptops in your company and those 10 laptops you want them to be able to connect wirelessly. But that's it, nobody else. You can make an actual list that says these 10 MAC addresses can connect, but no one else. As a matter of fact, you can filter in the other direction, which is where maybe you allow everyone to come in, but you know of someone who has tried to get into your network, and you want to say, you know what, I don't want to let that network card ever come into my network again. You could create a block list where you say this particular MAC address or this list of MAC addresses is not allowed to come in. Now again, I will tell you this is not very secure and the reason why is because something called MAC address spoofing is very easy to do. In other words, if you had, let's say, your whitelist of these 10 MAC addresses that are allowed onto your wireless network and there are utilities out there, okay, so I'm going to tell you there are utilities out there that somebody could very easily use to determine what any one of those MAC addresses are. Okay, they can, they can grab that right out of the airways by looking at your wireless network and say, aha, there's this communication taking place and it's from a computer with this MAC address. It's very easy to now take the computer that you want to attack the network from and assign that same MAC address, that duplicate MAC address to your wireless network card. And boom, you're in. Okay, so again, disabling SSID broadcast and doing MAC filtering helps keep the honest people honest, but that's about it. To take this a step further, we can use something called WEP. W-E-P, which is funny because uh, a lot of people, if you ask them what WEP stands for, they say it's the wireless encryption protocol. Kind of makes sense, right? Seems like it, because that's what WEP was for. It was for creating encryption. Believe it or not, WEP does not stand for the wireless encryption protocol. It technically stands for wired equivalency privacy. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I would more prefer to call it the wireless encryption protocol. And the reason why is because it's very laughable to say that it's the wired equivalency privacy. Meaning that was the idea when it was created. When it was first developed, the idea was to create a wireless network 
that was as private or as secure as a wired network. The problem is WEP was fairly quickly and fairly easily cracked. I mean, I can tell you that, and I, and I actually, I believe I do this in one of my wireless networking courses. I show you how you can go on the internet, download a free utility, which can fairly quickly and fairly easily just crack right through a WEP key. Okay, and this key is what's used to encrypt the data. Okay, so please understand that WEP was only used in the early stages of wireless networking, and if anybody's still using it today, they're not really secure. I'd almost rather they use SSID, you know, turn off that broadcast. <laughs> I'd be happier with that. The reason this became so popular, though, in the old days, is that it was very easy to configure. It did provide encryption for all the data transmitted over the wireless network. It started off using a 40-bit encryption key, which, again, when it first came out, was considered to be secure, but very quickly advanced to a 128-bit encryption, which again, for a while, was considered to be secure, but then a very short time later found that 128-bit encryption was not that difficult to crack. Okay, so that's kind of the easy thing. We just kind of sum this up. WEP. Don't use it. It does provide encryption, but it's easily cracked. What we moved into was something called WPA. Now WPA stands for Wireless Protected Access. And as you can see from the chart that I have here, it comes, well, we could say it comes in four different versions, but it's really two versions, each of which could be split into two different implementations. I'm gonna start with WPA Personal. And, you know, again, like I said with some of the other things in these wireless lessons, I can't go into deep, deep, deep detail on a lot of this, but I can tell you that the idea was we used a pre-shared key. In other words, there's an actual passphrase. And when using WPA Personal, there's an actual passphrase that is used to authenticate. So a client wants to connect to the wireless network and it's being secured with WPA you're going to have to enter in a, a password, right? You're this, this pre-shared key, this, this passphrase. It uses the TKIP cipher suite and the RC4 encryption mechanism. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of what that means as far as TKIP and RC4. I will tell you that they are considered to be quite secure. Matter of fact, they are almost, and I'm going to emphasize the word almost, not crackable. And what I mean by that is, it is crackable. There are ways to make it that it, it couldn't be cracked enough fast enough. And that's kind of the easier way to explain why we switched from WEP to WPA. Now, WPA Enterprise is exactly the same, except for the authentication mechanism, is going to use something called 802.1x and EEP. Okay, so this is a much more sophisticated form of authentication that is only used in an enterprise environment. And I'm going to ask you to hold off on my explaining that for just a moment because we're going to we're going to revisit that. But before I do, let's jump over to WPA2. This is the newer updated version of WPA. You will notice that again there is a personal and an enterprise implementation. The only difference being that the personal is going to use that pre-shared key or that passphrase and the enterprise is going to use 802.1x. The other aspect of WPA2 is that we now moved on to a more advanced and more flexible cipher suite and encryption mechanism of CCMP and AES. Now you'll notice that those are listed as the defaults but you'll also notice that TKIP and RC4 are optional. Why? So that we can have backward compatibility, which is always important to the true success of a standard. Okay? So when looking at this chart, what do I want you to pull from it? That there's a personal and an enterprise, and the difference is pre-shared key versus 802.1x. And then also we had WPA, which was the first implementation of this technology, using TKIP and RC4, and then we moved on to WPA 
2, which is the more current and more sophisticated version, which use CCMP and AES. But let's talk about 802.1x. 802.1x is an authentication mechanism which many enterprises will put in place not just for wireless networks, and I will tell you that whether it is used for wireless or otherwise, it's not a cheap, quick implementation. 802.1x requires the use of certificates and radius. Now, in case either of these terms are new to you, I will tell you that certificates are used to provide a higher level of authentication of the user and or computer attempting to connect. Certificates are a way of establishing identification cards, so to speak, for all of your users and computers. And those cards must be issued by a certificate server or a certification authority, as it's called. And I, I, I'm not going to go into a whole cer certification lesson with you here, but I can tell you that there is a whole level of sophistication to using certificates. But along with that sophistication also comes a higher form of authentication and a more secure form of authentication and a more reliable form of authentication. Now, RADIUS, a RADIUS server is used to centralize the connection requests. Okay, now, RADIUS goes beyond just a centralized server for connection requests. It centralizes rules surrounding connection requests and also includes an accounting, or some people like to refer to it as an auditing mechanism to it, okay, as far as keeping track of who's connected, when they connected, and for how long they connected. So again, just to kind of wrap this up, I could do an entire lesson on how to set up an enterprise level 802.1x. What you need to know here is the basics of what it's all about, and it's an enterprise level form of authentication using certificates and radius. And so that brings us to the end of this lesson, where now, hopefully, when you have people in your company who are asking if wireless is going to be secure enough to use, you should be able to feel comfortable that you can say yes. You know how to lock it down so that it will be secure enough to feel safe with the data that's being transmitted. Well, that's it. I'll see you in the next lesson.